Genesis chapter 2, this is Chosen in Christ, part 29, and um, the title is, Was There a Covenant of Works? And we're speaking specifically um, of God with man. <clears throat> You'll see as we go. Verse um, 7, Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground <clears throat> the Lord God uh, out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the middle of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, jump down to verse 15. Uh, the verses in between just talk about different rivers that are kind of hard to pronounce, so that's why I'm skipping them. Um, and the Lord God took the man... And put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, last week we did uh, the second part of... Um, God ordaining the elect unto eternal life. So that took two parts to cover that. And we tied Acts 13.48, which that phrase comes from, we tied that to several verses that indicated um, the words <clears throat> eternal life or everlasting life. And we showed that relationship between God ordaining um, the elect unto life and believing to eternal life and everlasting life. We also proved that uh, sovereign unconditional election of God in his predestination, it has a purpose and it's not some fatalistic thing with, with no purpose. It has a purpose. This week we're going to look at the question of whether uh, God made a covenant of works with Adam as some uh, covenant theology folks would have us believe. I want to make some clarifications after saying that, make some clarifications here. So some of uh, those that I associate with on social media or that I've known for a while that were listening on um, Facebook and um, YouTube won't think that we're out and out heretics. In, in the systematic theology um, that I hold to, that I've practiced for years and the terms that I use within my teaching as I talk about theology and doctrine and the gospel, I would readily agree with um, what's called federal theology. And all that is is where God has purpose to have two federal heads, Adam and Christ. And um, Actually, the scriptural reading, uh, Eric read Romans 5. That's what that talks about, verses 12 through 21. So we do not deny federal headship. We, we hold to it. Uh, this is, it's clearly taught in the scripture, but this covenant of works thing is not, in my opinion, and it does actually does damage to God's character. So please listen to my complaint along the way as I describe why. And uh, we'll be doing that as we go along. <clears throat> uh, here's another thing, too. I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. It seems like there's this expectation of, and I've noticed this for years, of a theologian or a teacher or a pastor to be fit into a certain specific box. Like if you believe sovereign grace, Calvinistic, Reformed theology, 
you have to hold to a, you have to be in a box. You have to hold, you have to follow these rules specifically. It's not the case. There is a variety of differences among sovereign grace, reformed theological uh, uh, Calvinistic groups. There are all kind of differences. And they're not um, head for head in full agreement on everything. Uh, that would be a miracle. That's why there's different um, groups and denominations and different views of eschatology, different views of church government, and so on and so forth. So this idea of <clears throat> a person believes a certain thing means he must also believe this with it. No, <laughs> not always. It's not always the case. And I see it and I see it. As we go along, not maybe today, but through the rest of the series, I'll try to point out where this is the case. I'll give you one example. Those that are, and don't get scared of the term, I know we said we're going to look into it in the near future, and we will. This idea of superlapsarianism. Uh, those that would be superlapsarian, most people ignorantly say that superlapsarians must hold to eternal justification. That's not the case. That's not the case. They use just John Gill, for example. I use John Gill as a commentator whenever I get stuck. You know, I'll read him, see what he has to say. I don't always agree with him, but uh, John Gill believed in eternal justification, which I don't agree with. But John Gill was in for Lapsarian. And I can prove this. I've, that he, had a, he had a sermon specifically against superlapsarianism, and he's an outspoken eternal justification guy. So you can't always put people in a certain box. It won't work. It's just we need to stop doing it. And um, systems sometimes try to force these matches that aren't necessarily there. Um, and, and sometimes these systems are popular systems based on trends or traditions. And you guys know I'm not into either one of those, right? So I'm going to rebel against what people say I have to hold to. And I'm going to follow what I see in the Scripture. I don't, I don't want to um, necessarily have to follow rules of tradition. Thanks. I don't know if you saw that. Everybody saw it. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> At least it didn't get on the keyboard. <clears throat> so, the Westminster Confession of Faith, I think everybody, a lot of people's heard of that. It's a famous confession of faith. And that is held to by, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote from it in a minute, that is held to by um, Presbyterians for the most part. These people would be considered Reformed. And the uh, 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, which uh, there's not really much difference between the two confessions. The Baptist one was changed in the area of baptism. But I think as far as I know, other than that, it's pretty much exactly the same. So these two confessions, the Westminster and the 1689, are very, very popular today amongst Sovereign Grace, Calvinistic, Reformed people. Those aren't the only confessions of faith. Uh, if anybody knows anything about confessions, you know there's a lot more than this. But these two deal with this, this covenant of works thing that I want to talk about today. That's why I'm quoting from them. And when I say that, that doesn't mean the rest of all the Reformed confessions hold to a covenant of works, because they all don't. And this just lends to my point that you just can't put everybody in a box or make a blanket statement that all Reformed people believe this, all Calvinists believe this, all Sovereign Grace people believe this. It's not the case. But uh, those two, Westminster and the 1689, has been very, very popular over the last uh, few hundred years. And I disagree with a lot of things in those two confessions. And it's not my point today to have a series of all the things I disagree with in those confessions. 
uh, I'll bring some of those things out from time to time. I just want to mention this one specific thing because it's it's involves our topic in our series, Unconditional Election or Chosen in Christ. Um, the majority, and, and I'll say this too, and I'll use this language, and I know it, um, it's, it's kind of a teaser because we're going to look closer and deeper and more into it in the coming weeks. But this phrase, uh, low Calvinism versus high Calvinism, it's related to infralapsarianism, superlapsarianism. So don't worry, we'll get into it. It'll be easy. We'll get, make some charts and stuff. It's going to be easy. But for those that know what it means, especially that are listening on video, the majority of, of people involved with um, these two confessions, in my opinion, are they come from what's called a low Calvinist perspective. And the the... the um, Confessions use phrases like God permits things instead of God decreeing things. Um, it uses all the infralapsarian language and not superlapsarianism language. So those Westminster divines, as they call them, or those that tailored the, the confession, were for the most part low Calvinist infralapsarian, which I am not. And, and I think this issue of the Covenant of Works digs into this problem. And uh, that's why we're going to investigate it a little bit today, <clears throat> this morning. Now, I, I've um, some people that I work with listen to this video sometimes, and um, they said um, that I'm going to have to tone down my terms and my language because I was speaking over their head. Now, I try to... You, know, you guys, week after week, hear this... Hear, the stuff that I talk about. So you're used to the terms, and it's hard for me to remember that there are other people out there that are brand new. <clears throat> so I really blew it this morning just using a few terms, you know. Uh, but if they'll stick around in the coming weeks, they'll learn what those terms are. And uh, I don't use those terms to, you know, try to be fancy. It's just uh, I don't know what other terms to use, and I'll explain them in the coming weeks. Um, I, I, and I'll say that again. I don't use those terms to be fancy. I don't like people. I don't even like people that use terms to be fancy. I don't like to be around them. So I don't want to do it myself. Um, but as time goes on, and as the audience gets broader, more spread out, people that know a lot, some people know way more than me that I'm talking to. And some people are brand new. And sometimes there's kids. Sometimes there's teenagers, older people. So people's been converted for a week. People's been converted for longer than me. You know how hard it is to communicate to that broad of spectrum of people? It's pretty hard. So sometimes I'll just apologize that, you know, I'm, I'm blowing it on covering everything for everybody every time. It's just not going to happen. So hopefully you can get something out of this as we, as we uh, go through here. Um, again, uh, not everybody that believes in sovereign grace, Calvinistic, reformed theology and doctrine walks lockstep together. It's just not going to happen it's on every single point. And there are some people that like when a judge really strict on it, if you don't walk, you know, lockstep, then you're going to hell. Uh, that means you, you're going to have to find somebody that believes exactly like you on everything. And you might not even be right about all that stuff. Now, I know a few pastors that are like pretty close. I just named them in the announcements. Two guys from Ohio. Uh, there's not many things I can think of. Right now, off the cuff, I can't think of anything that we disagree on. It just means we haven't sat down and talked long enough <laughs> to find out. But um, there, I make these general statements here and then move on to our topic. People, they grow and learn, and as they grow and learn, they adjust their language about doctrine and theology. When you're first converted, you don't automatically know everything. 
Now, you just learn the gospel and you learn enough gospel to convert you. And it is opposed to a false gospel that you just came out of. There's no doubt about that. So you look at the false gospel you came out of and you say, okay, I know what the primary issues are. I know I don't believe that anymore. I've come out of that. So you know what the gospel issues are. Now there are uh, secondary issues. Might have to do with eschatology, might have to do with church government, might have to do with um, just different things. And um, <clears throat> those things, and there's a lot of them, those things are not things that are going to dictate whether or not we are believers or not. You can look at, uh, what is it, Romans 14, and you can look at in Christian Liberty section. And you've got people disagreeing on, I know there's stronger and weaker brethren, but you've got people disagreeing on you know, meat versus herbs, wine versus no wine, Days versus not no special days. So Paul didn't say, yeah, just look at the weaker brother and say, dude, you're going to hell. He didn't say that. So there's way more issues than just those three in Romans 14. So um, if you have this idea that everybody has to believe exactly like you, even on secondary issues, you're going to paint yourself into a corner and... I don't know if anybody's ever done it. <clears throat> paint yourself into a corner, literally. You've got to walk on wet paint. <laughs> or you've got to wait a long time for that paint to dry. And uh, I don't know if anybody's ever done that. So, uh, there's a growing process. Uh, and my major growing process, to me, happened in the early 90s when I um, saw some of these issues about um, the more particulars about uh, high grace or high Calvinism versus low Calvinism. It had to do with, um, <clears throat> I just didn't know the language even existed about this well men offer stuff in common grace. I didn't even know it was there. I just, I assumed it was Arminianism when I learned about it. But that's when I started investigating these different lapsarian views, super versus infra, I didn't even know about that wasn't even an issue. So that was just like a couple years after I was converted. It was like in uh, 1990. But that was my major, my biggest change since I've been converted was on that issue right there. And it sort of put different lenses on everything that I looked at. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of what I hold to about that has come out in the series so far. This is message part 29. And this may be the, the strongest message today so far that you'll start to see the difference because of what I learned back then as compared to maybe the general Sovereign Grace Calvinistic Reformed theology that you see out there. You'll start to see some particulars, I think, today. Now, uh, there's a guy named, um, speaking of, let me, let me back up a little bit. I gave a little history about when I uh, had even heard those terms. I think it was back in 1990. Had a friend, he's passed away now. <clears throat> his name is uh, Greg Fields. Uh, he's the one that I got his library uh, after he passed away and um, uh, last year. And... Um, it was in 1990, he was, we had a discussion, and he was talking about this thing of uh, the well-men offer in common grace. And I said, uh, what, what are you talking about? And he explained it. And I said, Is that, isn't that just Arminianism? And um, he said, wow, he said, that's very astute. I said, no, it just seems like common sense to me. You know, I, I, I wasn't schooled in that, all that stuff, but he brought it up, used the terms, and it just didn't look right to me at the very beginning. And so I, I, I started reading about some of that, and we had a, a fellow from the PRC, the Protestant Reformed Church, come and preach for us 
Um, his name was Charles Terpstra. <clears throat> and he did a message on common grace, against common grace, and one message against the well-meant offer. And uh, <clears throat> it was there that I saw that there was a problem among Sovereign Grace Calvinistic Reformed groups, that there was that, when he preached against that, I, first of all, I didn't know it even existed. I just thought it was Arminianism. But when he preached against it, I saw, wow, there's some serious compromise, in my opinion, amongst all these groups. It's like a, a watering down of Sovereign Grace. But the Protestant Reformed Church, they reject the idea of covenant of works. I'm, a, I'm in agreement with them against the covenant of works. And their popular theologian uh, back in the day <clears throat> is Herman Hoxima. And in his uh, Systematic Theology book, he uh, has some arguments uh, against the covenant of works, which I have not read all of them. I didn't have time this week to look at them. But another guy who um, <clears throat> I met, and some of the ladies here met at a conference in Tennessee, David Inglesma, uh, he's from the PRC, and he uh, has written against the Covenant of Works also. There was another guy, too, that early on that was uh, helpful to me to seeing some of this, who has uh, passed away since. His name is W.E. Best. He was a Baptist uh, pastor from uh, Tennessee, or I'm sorry, Texas. But that was like 90, 91, I read uh, W.E. Best. I think we have some W.E. Best books over here. But anyway, let's throw those two names out there because some people see some of those books, some of those authors. And uh, just not that it matters that I would not mention them, but there are other people that are saying what I'm saying here. Um, so, I'm going to quote from chapter 6 of these two confessions, the 1689 <clears throat> Baptist Confession and the Westminster Confession. Chapter 6 of those confessions, entitled, Of the Fall of Man, of Sin, and the Punishment Thereof. <clears throat> Just a short paragraph here. Section 1. Now, I'm going to slow down when I get to the part, or I might stop and insert some comments as we go along so I can emphasize uh, why I'm not agreeing with this. <clears throat> Although God created man upright and perfect and gave him a righteous law, notice this, which had been unto life had he kept it. Now, this is... This is the part I want us to pay attention to. Which had been unto life if he had kept it, and threatened death upon the breach thereof. Yet he did not long abide in this honor, Satan using the subtility of the serpent to subdue <clears throat> Eve, then by her seducing Adam, who without any compulsion willfully did willfully transgress the law of their creation and the command given unto them in eating the forbidden fruit, which God was pleased, according to his wise holy counsel, to permit, having purposed in order it to his own glory. And they cite Genesis 2, 16 and 17, which we've already read, <clears throat> Genesis 3, 12 and 13, and 2 Corinthians eleven three. Now, much of this language that we're talking about and using here in Reformed theology, they talk about a time of probation. A time of probation. This is like a trial period, right? So under uh, Section 7, which is entitled, Of God's Covenant with Man, in Sections 2 and 3, it says this, and I will emphasize some of the words here so you can know why we're here. The first covenant was made with man was a covenant of works. Notice this. Wherein life was promised to Adam and in his posterity upon 
condition of perfect and personal obedience. Section 3, the first part of this line stands out. <clears throat> Man, by his fall, notice this, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, the Lord had pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offered unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him, and that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. <clears throat> Notice that first part. That's the end of the quote. The first part there, the last part of part two talks about wherein life was promised to Adam if he uh, fulfilled this condition of personal and perfect obedience. And then it says, by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant. So what, he is, what they're saying here is God had this plan. God had this purpose of here's the promise if you do this, you will have this. And it was a conditional covenant with Adam based on perfect obedience. Now, having said that, we'll see what the Word of God says. We've already read, but I want to go to two verses. Uh, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and we'll look what the Bible says, God's Word says and states, concerning the threat of death without the promise of life, especially eternal life. I say, especially eternal life. Notice in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but... Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For, or because, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, it's not my purpose to wear out everybody with quotes from uh, Reformed theologians trying to support their covenant of works by their commentary. I'm going to give you a little bit of quotes here so they can go further and explain what they mean by this. I, hopefully you can already see that this promise of life is not in the text. The threat is there. It's surely there. The day you eat thereof you shall surely die. But there is no promise of life, especially eternal life. Um, I didn't look up and see all the fellows that held to the specifics here on this, but Charles Hodge was, a, was one. Um, Louis Burkhoff is who I'm going to quote here, and Louis Burkhoff used Herman Bavnik to back up his, his quote. But in Louis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology, Part 4, under the section, Man in the Covenant of Works, under that section, Section C, called Elements of the covenant of works, point number one under there called the contracting parties, and under there part B, under the section, the covenant relationship. I gave all that information, so if anybody was going to look that up in a systematic theology booth, they can find it. You can find it online, too. <clears throat> but here the commentary on this it, it gets way worse than, than the quote in the confession in case there was any doubt on what was meant, here's what these guys are saying. He was temporarily put on probation. Again, this is Louis uh, Burkhoff. He was temporarily put on probation in order to determine whether he would willingly subject his will to the will of God. He was given the promise of eternal life in the way of obedience, and thus, by gracious disposition of God, acquired certain conditional rights. This covenant enabled Adam to obtain eternal life for himself and for his descendants in the way of obedience. 
Section 2, the promise of the covenant. Now, there'll just be just a few paragraphs here, and then we'll be done, and then I will talk about why we don't agree with this. I don't agree with this. He goes on, and, and uh, this gets bad. He gets, uh, just hang in there. <clears throat> the great promise of the covenant of works was the promise of eternal life. They who deny the covenant of works generally base their denial in part on the fact that there was no record of such promise in the Bible. And it is perfectly true that the scripture contains no explicit promise of eternal life to Adam. But the threatened penalty clearly implies such a promise. We got this so far? All right, he goes on. When the Lord says, For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, his statement clearly implies, If Adam refrains from eating, he will not die. And notice this. But will be raised above the possibility of death. The implied promise certainly cannot mean, in the case of obedience, Adam would be permitted to live on in the usual way. That is, to continue an ordinary natural life, for that's the life that he's already has by virtue of his creation, and therefore could not be held out as a reward for obedience. You sticking with me so far? He, he's, he's making a distinction here. It's not just the regular old life that he's already got. It is something above that. So he's going to give more detail here. He goes on. The implied promise evidentially, uh, evidently was that a life raised to its highest development of uh, perennial bliss and glory. Adam was indeed created in the state of positive holiness and was also immortal in the sense that he was not subject to the law of death. But he was only at the beginning of his course and did not yet possess the highest privileges that were in store for man. He was not yet raised above the possibility of erring, sinning, and dying. <clears throat> he was not yet in possession of the highest degree of holiness, nor did he enjoy life in all its fullness. The image of God in man was still limited by the possibility of man's sinning against God, changing from good to evil and becoming subject to the power of death. And uh, it's going to wind up here in this last statement. The promise of life in the covenant of works was a promise of the removal of all the limitations of life which Adam was still subject to and of the raising of his life to the highest degree of perfection. So there you have it. I, I hope you understood the difference and the distinction that he made there. He said, and the main thing I want us to see is he, what he was saying there was, and we know the state of Adam before the fall, way different than uh, what we were when we were born, right? So he was saying that, you know, the promise of just the regular perpetual life was, was not the promise. It was higher than that. It was eternal life, not just regular Adam's, whatever you would consider Adam's life being regular, not just regular life for Adam, not just that he would live and not physically die. He, talking about eternal life. This is the covenant of works. This is the promise, the reward for this covenant of works. So how does that view of God's purpose or intent affect the view of God's overall purpose in salvation? This is what I want us to see. And I think this is when you'll start to see some of my bias in, in how I hold to sovereign grace is way different than the majority of um, sovereign grace Calvinist reconformed people out there. <clears throat> they do admit to a command and threat of death not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they say that there is a reward of eternal life 
for obedience. And they say that that's implied. Again, let's look at the verse. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now again, they say a reward is implied in that threat. So again, I ask the question, do you have to believe in the covenant of works, as these guys explained it, to hold to the federal headship of both Adam and Christ, as Eric read in Romans 5. It's clearly there in Romans 5. You don't have to hold to the covenant of works, so we are not going to be forced to be squeezed into this box that we shouldn't be in in the first place. The box should be destroyed, and that's what I'm you know, kind of doing today, hopefully, in the minds of some. So, just a few points here before... Uh, get too far along. Notice that, uh, and I've alluded to this during the series, <clears throat> Adam did not agree with God in a covenant here. This was something that God laid down without asking Adam. God sovereignly told Adam what was going to happen, how it was going to be. And we know that this is the purpose of God before the foundation of the world. Notice again verse 17. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, ye shall not eat of it. For, notice this, in the day that you eat of it, ye shall surely die. This is like a matter of fact. In the day that you eat of it. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. This is the purpose of God. This is going to happen. Eternal, unconditional election in Christ has already taken place before this. Before this command not to eat. The elect have already been chosen. Do we understand here the absolute sovereignty of God? That there is nothing stopping the fall of man into sin taking place right here. There's nothing that's going to stop it. This carrot on a stick thing that's imagined, it's not there. Nothing's going to stop the fall. You know why? Because what's purposed ahead of the fall for the glory of God, nothing's going to stop the glory of God and the death of Jesus Christ. That's why the earth was created. So then we can ask some common questions. Uh, did Adam and Eve have a free will before the fall? And this is a popular question. And a lot of people rush and say, oh yeah, they're the only two that ever had a free will. Because their will was influenced, not influenced by sin. It was absolutely free. And people say that short-sighted. Um, was the only thing involved their sin? What about the decree of God that Adam and Eve was going to fall? Again, I go back to that statement. There is nothing that's going to stop the fall. Nothing. I don't care what you do with Adam's and Eve's will. If you call it free, you're wasting your time. It's not free. The sovereignty of God is way ahead of their will. So if you insist, uh, yes, that they had a free will, I don't think you see the trajectory of what has already eternally been put in motion and purposed by the one and only true sovereign God that works everything after the counsel of his own will, the one who has already declared the end from the beginning. Already. This is not God running around saying, oh, I didn't realize that was going to happen. So again, let's make a distinction here as this one theologian we read from also made the distinction between perpetual life that Adam already had, and eternal life. These are two different things. Even though the first, if we just look at the first perpetual life that he already had, and, I mean, you take away the idea that this guy was talking about eternal life, take that out of the picture, just say perpetual life. That wasn't even purposed by God. Just that wasn't purposed by God. Adam was going to sin. 
he was going to sin. And therefore, it was not uh, possible in, in God's reality, in truth, that preceded the decree that preceded creation. So there is a difference between perpetual life and eternal life. Also, we need to look at this idea of knowing that Adam was peccable. Adam had the potential to fall. That's the way he was created. As opposed to Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ is impeccable. He cannot fall. He cannot sin. That is one thing Christ cannot do. He cannot sin. Some people say, well, it's, it's because he will not sin. Well, him willing not to sin is based on the fact that he can't. Same with totally depraved sinners. People say, well, they won't come to Christ. It's based on they can't. Right? So the reward, according to these Reformed theologians from these popular confessions, the reward was to cross over into a new state and it sounds like the state would be from peccable to impeccable. To regular old perpetual regular life to eternal life. Now, what do we know about eternal life from the scripture? Something I think we should know right off the bat. <clears throat> eternal life is only in by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is the resurrection and the life. That's not some new idea. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This has always been the purpose of God. This is, he is the I am. He's not changed in reference to that purpose. So man, even pre-fall man, Adam before the fall, cannot raise himself to that level of life. It can't be done. And I have no idea why some of these guys have made this stuff up. It's just not there. Turn, if you would, um, to 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> In verse 47. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 47. Paul writing to the church at Corinth, his first letter. And he says this. A lot of this bulk of this chapter is talking about the resurrection. Verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. He's speaking of Christ. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne in the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. All right, so Adam, as earthy, just with his perpetual life, he cannot inherit the kingdom in that state. And he would have to switch over to the heavenly to inherit incorruption, the type of incorruption that equals eternal life. You see, in both cases, it's not going to happen. In other words, Adam didn't have the power or the promise to change himself from earthly to heavenly. He didn't have the power or the promise. It's not there. 
And also there seems to be a major problem here with man meriting something from God besides death. Because that's all that he's ever merited from God. And that is all that's purposed, that he can merit from God, is death. And that's all that was there in the garden was the promise and the threat of death when Adam was to eat of the fruit. The wages of sin is death. So the very basic idea of the obedience of a mere creature to the Creator is that it is their responsibility. It's their reasonable service. Uh, not to merit a reward or to, to gain something from God so that God would owe them something, that God would be in debt to them. That's never been the purpose. Especially eternal life, which having already eternally purposing eternal life in Christ for the elect. So Adam, the idea would be Adam remaining faithful for a certain length of period of time, a probation, to finally merit a higher life, eternal life, we see, according to the scriptures, it is a myth not found in God's word. It is, it is against the promises of God. And I think in the weeks to come, we'll, we'll see more and more of how that it's against the promises of God. Uh, it seems to make Genesis 3.15, which says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. I will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It seems to make that like a plan B. This covenant of works thing didn't work out. Here's what I'll do right here. And he comes up with 315. And we know that election was even before this promise. This promise unfolded in time because of God's decree and counsel of his love for his people and his election of his people. So in conclusion, um, it is, to me, biblically obvious that God did not purpose to glorify himself in the earned eternal life of Adam and all he represented, which was the whole world without exception. It was not God's purpose to glorify himself that way. We know that God's overarching purpose in all things was to glorify himself and magnify himself in his redemptive character as both a just God and a Savior as he he perfectly displayed that at the cross when Christ accomplished an effectual, satisfactory, definite atonement, perfect death, sacrificial death for his sheep. And the merit of that is imputed to their account for their justification and eternal life. That's the decree of God. That's what it is. And it's always been by grace alone and never has been by works. There has not even been the proposed idea. Salvation has always been unconditional. And when you bring things like this up, this, this covenant of works thing, you start to dip into proposed hypotheticals. Well, if this happened, this would happen. And it makes it, it, you start fidgeting with the atonement. You start tinkering with the atonement, what the atonement actually is. As if the atonement, and this when you get into stuff like, well, the death of Christ is um, sufficient with, for the whole world without exception and only efficient for those that believe. And some people will take that and make faith a condition, which makes that death efficient for the believers. Now, when we get into uh, the purpose of God uh, on down through this series in reference to um, the elect and the non-elect, we'll start to see some of those things in more detail. Talk about the free offer, so-called, 
common grace, so-called, and we'll try to show how these things are not biblical. And how that they, they affect the character of God, and some of them affect the atonement. The main thing, in other words, affects the main thing. So I hope that was uh, comprehensive. Um, that was probably, should have been a two-parter. I crammed a lot in there. And I know when you quote people and I read quotes, it to me, I should have had a printout. To me, it's easier to follow when somebody reads along. It's boring to hear long quotes. I, I say that from my own experience, hearing them. Um, but I gave the references there. I gave some names and some people, you know, whoever's listening, they can do further research if they don't believe me. Um, I expect you to do your own research because... Uh, I read exactly what they wrote, <laughs> and I don't like what they wrote. I don't want to be a part of that. <clears throat> uh, another thing, too. <clears throat> 1689, Confession, the Baptist form of the Westminster. Uh, uh, you know, there's some things I disagree with. I Mostly Reformed Baptists hold of that. A lot of times people automatically assume that because we believe in um, believers' uh, immersion, immersion of believers' baptism, you know, believers only, that we are Reformed Baptists. We are not Reformed Baptists. We're not. Several reasons, and we talk about the reasons all the time. Uh, I've not met any Reformed Baptists that are anywhere close to the particulars that we hold to. That's why we're not in that denomination. We're not in the box, you know. You got to be a good. You got to be a, a, a cowboy to lasso some theologians. I'm not going to be lassoed. You better be a good cowboy. I'm not playing the. I'm not in the box. The God we believe in is not in the box either. Sometimes we talk about, um, you know, doctrine and theology, and, and we talk about God. And people say, you've put God in a box. You know, no matter, what, no matter what direction you go, you've got a complaint, right? How do I know? Because I'm complaining about other people. <laughs> There's complaints all around. And it's our obligation and duty to find uh, what the truth is. And um, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world. I mean, we grow and learn. We don't want to sweep things under the carpet uh, when we come to a secondary issue, we can put it on a back burner and say, well, I'll get to that, but it's not worth me stopping everything. I'm going to take a two-week vacation off work and study that because i got to get to the bottom of that. You know, There's not been anything that's been that important since I've believed the gospel to have to do that with. Any questions or comments? Yeah. When uh, they were talking about Adam and Adam and life, just uh, life, and then if he obeyed, he would have eternal life. Well, uh, from reading Genesis 2, no, uh, they make references to uh, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Well, then he expounds further, and he says the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. Right. And the tree of good knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of life that they're speaking of, is that a type and a shadow of Christ? Because when Christ talks about him being the true vine, if they would have, you know, I, I'm just, I'm asking. Because I'm, yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard... <clears throat> I've heard some people say that that are like way better in the Old Testament than I am. That are really <clears throat> heavy into uh, you know typology and, and way smarter than me. That yes, that would would be a type of Christ, the tree of life. Um, so it, it doesn't say. I mean, our, uh, having read that verse in, in verse nine, and we did in our introductory reading, are we to say that that meant Adam? didn't eat from that tree, he had the opportunity, but he just didn't eat from it. And it doesn't say one way or the other. Um, I know typology at a certain point, it'll, it'll break down at a certain point. Um, we see later 
there was a cherubim that had a flaming sword that blocked Adam from that tree. We know that there was a change in Adam <clears throat> after he sinned. He died. He died a legal death. He was declared condemned legally. He died a spiritual death in that he became totally depraved. He lost all of his abilities to see and understand. Uh, that was a big deal. Like was it a split second. But just saying it's a, that was a, all of a sudden a split second change. And now he was in need of justification and the new birth. Right? So he was in need of Christ. And he didn't have the free will just to say, come here, Christ, I, now that I've lost this path, I need you. He didn't have the power just to turn around because he just freshly lost all he had. He said, Christ, okay, now I want to fix this. Come here. I want to take care of this. It's not the way it works. You know, it had to be like everybody else that was elect that, you know, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and that's through faith. That's through the gospel, through whatever means of communication back then. We know later on, uh, Cain and Abel there, you know, Abel had the sacrifice, and we, we start to see contrast between two peoples. There's conjecture, you know, both ways whether or not Adam was saved or lost, and some people say, well, Adam had to be saved because he's probably the one that told Abel about, you got to have a sacrifice like that. I know because God had to sacrifice the skin so me and Eve could put them on. You know, there's all kind of conjecture about what took place. And uh, I'm not much into conjecture, and I'm not going to follow this line of conjecture here, that the other side of the thread implied a reward of eternal life especially, not just perpetual life. Does that touch on kind of, yeah. times have we seen throughout scripture that you know uh, even when uh, the Jews with uh, Abraham they kept going back and saying you know we have heard of Father Abraham right Christ says it was you know if you were of your father Abraham you would have looked to see me so even they were blinded to yeah 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 there's uh we're going to talk about a lot of levels of blindness as we go through here uh, we're going to talk about get specific about God blinding. And we did some messages uh, about God hiding himself, uh, having glory by hiding himself. And so we're going to get, you know, I held back a lot of verses and a lot of uh, negative stuff that we're going to get into. I say negative. What most people are offended by, you know, the non-election side. There's a lot of stuff in there that people... Uh, they don't want to look at it. They refuse to look at it. They just want to shut that door. I don't want to look in there. <laughs> but it's pretty clear about what's going on. And that's what made me say a lot of what I said today. Like, nothing is going to stop Adam's sin. Nothing is going to stop it. And you have weird, I mean, I mentioned this not too long ago. I went to a conference of the same type of people that I left after I was converted. A conference. I thought, you know, there were some books for sale. That's why I went. And, uh, you know, I still knew some of those people. I was wanting to maybe catch up with some, check them out, talk to them, pass out the card, you know, try to get them to look at the website, maybe get them to come to a conference or two. Networking, you know. And um, <clears throat> one of the guys got up and he, he said that he's been trying to figure this out for years. He cannot understand why God allowed sin to come into the world. He just couldn't understand it. And I thought, yeah, and now I know why I, one of the reasons why I departed from that group of people is because that's a basic, that's a basic question, why God, you know, it's for his glory to get to something better. It's what he had purposed way before his glory and the death of his son, the magnification of his character. So taking that other, other view you would think would cause people to look at God as always like trying to play catch-up. 
plan B, C, D, chasing his tail, being surprised, maybe possibly being anxious, and not understanding uh, the sovereignty of God, what it means, what it actually means. It means that you're not sovereign, and He is. Um, and it takes God to reveal that to a person, open their eyes. I mean, we used to be, we used to be over there on that side. God made to differ and to show us. And um, <clears throat> it's so clear nowadays. And and hopefully by the end of this series, I mean, th I'm telling you, there's some stuff coming up that uh, I'm going to get some hate mail. I'll probably get some from this today. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> yeah. but there, you know, some of the stuff I mentioned, um, some of the people that are that dabble in theology didn't even know that some of these guys are saying this, and I think hopefully they'd look at this quickly and say, "I'm not going there," and and rightly so, you know. Anything else? Okay.